Welcome back to Physics 272. Last time, I don't feel the same way. After a long weekend, you know, after a long weekend of taking a break from physics, or as the case may be, not taking a break from physics, but it's good to be back. Okay, so motors and generators is what we talked about last time. And the basic concept there is that because a magnetic field applies a force on a moving charge, okay? or because a magnetic field applies a force on a current carrying wire, then we can use that idea to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy and vice versa by taking a wire and dragging it through a crossed magnetic field. Okay? So that was the concept last time. Today is all about Gauss's law. Sometimes we have bullet points here, but today it's just we will get to Gauss's law today. Is everybody ready? All right, so for Gauss's law, we're going to have to think about flow and source and sink and drain and those kind of concepts. And we're going to have to define something called flux. So let me try to give you an intuition about something called flux. We'll talk about electric flux, but first I want to talk about particle flux. So I can think about water as it flows around. And I can either think of it from kind of the big macroscopic level of I see this river going by and there's a certain amount of flow rate in the river, or I could think very microscopically about it. And I can look at a particular spot and look at individual molecules going by. Okay? And if I were thinking in, along the lines of individual molecules going by, I might think, well, let me take a little area, a little cross-sectional area, and talk about the number of molecules that go by per second times that cross-sectional area that would be the idea of a particle flux. So thinking along those lines, <clears throat> let me give you a, a physical situation. We're going to make an analogy between water, okay, water flow, and electric flux. <clears throat> so let me give you a physical situation here that I think you already have an intuition about, and then we'll use that to develop intuition about electric fields and electric flux. So here's a fountain. It's kind of interesting, right? I see water spilling out over the bowl. And from this angle, I, I, all I see is that well, I have a full bowl and I have water spilling out of the bowl. All right? Now, what should I conclude about what's going on inside the bowl with regard to the water? I could think, well, <coughs> maybe <coughs> water is being miraculously created inside the bowl. Poof, 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 poof. I've found the source of all water on Earth. You know, it's just poof, poof being created. Or I might think, well, there's probably a water faucet in there somewhere. Okay? There's probably piping somewhere bringing water into the bowl. So I observe water flowing out through some boundary. In this case, the boundary is the edge of the bowl. And so I could take the edge of the bowl, and I could say, oh, there's all this water flowing over the edge of the bowl. And I could count how much water, how many water molecules per second are flowing out that boundary. And that would tell me the flow rate of whatever faucet is coming into the bowl. Does that make sense? This should be totally intuitive, I hope. Right? Okay. We've just got a lot of chatter going on in the classroom, and it's hard for me to talk over that with a sticky throat. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, we're going to have the remote control issue today. Okay. And then I'm going to have to go to here and actually push a button. All right. Now, this is a different case. In this case, this is actually a lovely fountain at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And here you see water flowing down, but if I look simply at this little pool right here, I would measure, well, there's water flowing over the edge, a certain amount of water flowing over the edge there, and I'd see over here that there's a certain amount of water flowing in, and I could measure that what's flowing in, that flow rate, is equal to the flow rate going out, and so I would conclude that inside this pool right here, there is no source inside that pool, okay? Water's flowing in, water's flowing out, there's not a source inside that, that little surface area. So if I see the same coming in as out, I, I, I know there's not a source. In this case, I see a certain amount flowing out over the edge of the bowl, and I conclude there must be a source inside. So we're going to use that same kind of physical intuition in studying electric field lines, and we'll define something like <clears throat> something analogous to flow, which is electric flux, and we'll be able to use the concept of electric flux to figure out if there's a charge inside of a, of a closed surface or not. So here, in the case of the water fountain analogy, I could look at the rim of the bowl, and I count over the rim of the bowl, and everywhere along the rim of the bowl, I could say how many particles per second are passing over the edge here, and I conclude there must be a source somewhere in the, in the bowl, and the source of the water is a water faucet. 
not some magical pixie at the bottom creating water molecules, but a water faucet. In the case here of electric field, I could do the same sort of thing. I could say, oh, I have a point charge, and it's putting out electric field lines. And so you know what the shape of the electric field is coming off of a point charge, all right? It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared, all pointed away from the, the charge itself. And now if I think of encapsulating this closed charge in an imaginary sphere, so put an imaginary sphere over that point charge, and I could stand anywhere on the sphere, and I could make an analogy between the electric field lines that are poking through the sphere and make an analogy between that and water. So if I think of the electric field lines acting a little bit like water flowing out, and I walked all around the sphere and I measured all around the sphere and I saw electric field lines poking out of the sphere, poking out of the sphere, poking out of the sphere, I would have to conclude there's some sort of charge inside in the same way that I concluded there was a water faucet inside of that bowl there. Okay, so, so in the two cases I'll draw some sort of, of boundary around the system. Here water is flowing out of the bowl. There must be a source inside. The source of water is a water faucet. In the same way, when I draw a sphere around this point charge, and I think about the electric field as something that's kind of like flowing through the sphere, poking the sphere, and add up all that contribution, I'd see that there must be a source inside. There must be an, um, a charged particle inside. So charges are the source of electric fields. Do you have any questions so far about the analogy or the physical intuition? Okay, so the basic concept is that in the same way that you can diagnose whether there's a faucet somewhere based on the flow of water, you can diagnose whether there's a charge somewhere based on the electric flux. And we'll make that a mathematical concept. So electric flux is very much like water flow. So think of water flowing through a net, okay? Water flows through a net at a certain rate. And in the net, I have little boxes, okay, little squares through which the water can flow. And I could look at any individual square and I could simply count. I could stand on the square and count one molecule, two molecule, three molecule, however many molecules per second are flowing through that square. And if I wanted to get the entire uh, particle flux, the entire uh, water molecule flux through the net, I would add up that contribution over all the squares. And I would say, okay, there's a certain number of molecules per second times the area of this square, and then go to the next square, certain number of molecules per second times the area of this square, and so forth, and add up that whole contribution, and I would get something that follows water molecules per second times area. Okay? Now, I could take the same situation, and let me take the same net, so same exact net. Think of this net as being in a pipe, so that the net is uh, tied down, okay, all around the, the, where it meets the pipe. And now as I start the water flowing, I could think of this net deforming, right? The net itself, maybe it's a little bit stretchy. I could deform it this way. I could deform it that way. I could deform it in a funny shape. But when I go back to do that same calculation in order to measure the flow rate in the pipe, even if the net deforms, so maybe the net deforms and my squares get a little bit bigger, I could still stand on a square and watch the molecules per second coming through that square times the area of that square and if I moved to the next square in the net and did the same thing, molecules per second coming through the square times the area of that square, what I'd find is that even though the net deformed and some of the squares got bigger, the angle of the squares with respect to the flow rate would, would shift so that you know, a, a, square, a square that's head on the flow rate gets a lot of molecules per second through it. But a square that's not head on gets a smaller number of molecules through second, per second through it. And so, both cases, whether the net deforms or not, I would measure the same flow rate through the pipe. Okay? So this gets us kind of thinking about, we can make an analogy between this kind of concept and electric flux. So in the case of electric flux, the, the, the flow <laughs> is going to be electric field lines. So I'll think of electric field lines poking through surfaces, and I'll stand on any square in the net, okay, and I'll measure the contribution of the electric field that's poking through that net, all right, times the area of that little square, and then add it up for the next square, and add it up for the next square. And you can see where this is going. Anytime we take something where we're going to add up small contributions over a large system, we're going to end up taking an integral. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, either about the water flow analogy or, or where we're headed. Okay, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> so. We're now ready to define electric flux itself. So electric flux is defined as, the three bars mean define as, 
Here's mathematically how I would write down all those ideas for an electric flux. So I would say, I need an electric field, but I need to dot it into something. The reason I need to take a dot product somewhere is, again, if I think of a flow rate coming by the front of the classroom, and I'm thinking about a net trying to capture that flow rate, if the, if the net turns toward the side a little bit, I need something in the mathematics that tells me a sideways net is going to catch less flowing through it. So there must be a dot product somewhere. Okay? And I can either think of taking a dot product of this sideways net, the projection of it perpendicular to the flow, or I can think of taking a projection of the flow onto the perpendicular of the net. I'll show you what that means. So here, uh, we write it down this way. Electric field dotted into some vector n hat times uh, the area contributions on each of the little squares. And at the end of the day, the summation over the tiny areas of every little square will end up turning into an integral in the limit of small squares. So the n is a normal. So here I'm thinking of defining electric flux through a, a surface area here. So here's a surface area that is uh, a rectangular shape that's in the yz plane. So your axes here are x, y, and z. This is a plane. This is the yz plane. But I've got a little piece of area there that's going to act like a net measuring flow through it. And I have, in this case, a constant electric field, just to, to have a, a nice simple case to get intuition about. So the electric field in this case is along the x-axis. Uh, the magnitude is constant. And here are the field lines I've drawn to represent that. And what this n is is a um, unit vector that is perpendicular to the area that you're looking at. So in this case, where I have um, a small a, a rectangle that is on the yz plane, then the normal to that is, is this vector here. Okay? Or here, when I've, got, um, when I've got the area tilted downward so that uh, I have the area lying in the xz plane, the normal is perpendicular to that. Or here, where I've got it tilted by some angle, then the normal is always perpendicular to the plane. So for any plane you can define, there's always one and only one direction that's perpendicular to it. All right? And this normal defines that direction for you. And the magnitude of that vector is set up to be 1. So it's a unit vector that tells you the normal to the plane. Do you have any questions about n? OK. All right. So if I think then, well, what does this mathematically mean in these three cases? So I'll think of a case here where I have an area that's perpendicular to the flow. Again, think of this like a net that's perpendicular to the flow. I should catch a lot of water. So I'll get lots of flux in this case because E dotted into that normal n will basically give me the full contribution, right? Whereas here, in this case, the electric field is flowing past my net, but I'm not really catching any because it's, it's, it's just flowing over the net. And the way that's represented in the mathematics is that E dot n, in this case, since n is perpendicular to the electric field, E dot n hat in that case is 0. And I'll catch no flux here. So lots of flux here, no flux here. And in the case when I have it tilted a little bit, I'll have an intermediate amount of flux. Okay? So this is the equation that defines flux. And these are kind of the, the physical situations corresponding to different angles. Do you have any questions so far? All right. So this is the mathematical definition of electric flux. But it's a flexible concept. You could use it for different things. So for example, we thought at the beginning of the class about um, water flux. We thought about water molecules per second times an area going through something. You can also think in terms of, of any other kind of flux you like. Um, so electric flux is right here. But you can also think in terms of fish flux. So here I brought Dory into the picture. So here's Dory. Right? There's a certain flux of Dorys going by. And I could think of these areas as like nets that are going to catch a certain number of fish. So if the net is perpendicular to the direction that the school of fish is flowing, I'll get a lot of fish. If the net is tilted a little bit, I'm going to catch fewer fish. If the net is completely parallel to the, the school of fish, I'm not going to catch any fish. All right? Or Bruce here will go hungry in this case, but Bruce will catch a lot of fish in this case. All right. Do you have any questions about? Either fish flux or water flux or electric flux. Okay? All right. All right. You might be asking yourself, what does that stand for? That stands for what the flux, right? Okay. So we're going to calculate flux, all right? The flux is E dot N dA. And I have this situation here. I want to say, given 
that I have an electric field of 5 newtons per coulomb parallel to the x direction, okay? And I want to take this case right here. I want, I want things, I want to take an area that's rotated by an amount theta, theta is 30 degrees. I'm going to rotate from the yz plane around the z axis, okay? So the physical situation is this. I had um, an area that was parallel to the yz plane. This is the z axis, right, according to the diagram up there, and I'm going to rotate just along this direction. So it stays attached to the z-axis but rotates around it by an amount 30 degrees, all right? And I'm going to have a, a net here of 1 meter by 0.2 meters. What's the flux? What's the electric flux through the net, okay? All right, we've got a lot of votes in, so go ahead and take some time and discuss with your neighbor how to solve the problem. All right, do you want a little bit more time? Are you ready? Ready to discuss? All right, so what's, what's your step one here? How, how do I go about solving this? What's your, what's your step one? Yeah? OK. So you need to draw, right? OK, so I hope everybody you know, was, was scribbling diagrams and things like that. So, so one of, the, one of the ways to do this, so we have our we have the axes, okay, that we're given in the problem x, y, and z, all right? And we have, uh, so, so you're talking about one way to solve this problem is, look, it's about flux, right? So it's about catching things through a net. So I, you know, in the top diagram, I have this y, z here. The bottom diagram, it's in the x, z plane. But we want to calculate the middle point where it's rotated from the yz plane about the z axis by an amount theta, but it's about flux. So one way to do that is that I want to take the projection of this area onto the normal to the electric field. So that can be your step one, okay? Um, and so that's, that's definitely one, one route to do it, in which case you would need a cosine of theta in order to project this area onto something that's perpendicular to the field. Now, the math is telling us a slightly different route, but they're equivalent, okay, which is why both are going to work. So the math is telling us to take e dot n hat. So let me show you both ways, and hopefully then we'll see that they're equivalent. Okay? So this is saying I need to find an n hat. So let me um, draw out a geometric diagram and, and show you how this is going. So this is a line that's parallel to the y-axis. All right. I also have the net that I need to find. Okay, there's the theta. This is the net, so I need the area of that thing, all right? But the electric field in this case is parallel to the x-axis. So let me draw an electric field vector, all right? So that's the direction of the electric field parallel to x, all right? And what the math told me to do is that I need to figure out how to take e dotted into n. So I need to find the normal, all right? So here's that area. n hat is a vector that's normal to the area. Right? It's perpendicular to this plane of the area. So if I'm very careful here, I should be able to draw a vector that represents n hat. Okay? And now I hope from the geometry here, we'll be able to figure out what the angles are that we need. Okay? So I have an angle here. So I have some triangles that I've written down. All right? Well, one triangle here. So there's an angle theta here. What's this angle here back at the 90 degrees? Pi what? Yep. Okay, so then what's the angle here? Okay, I'm going to have to, um, yeah, okay, 60 degrees, because we were given theta equals 30, so in our, in our um, specific example, this is going to be a 30, 60, 90 triangle, or in general, I can write down over here, pi over 2 minus theta. Okay, can you kind of see that there? All right, and then the angle here, since this is a normal, is pi over 2. And then right here, this angle right here has to be what? I've got a pi over 2 minus theta. I've got a pi over 2. What's going to go right there? It's got to be theta, right? Or if you go back to thinking in terms of your 30, 60, 90 triangle, since theta was 30 here, there's a 30, 60, 90 triangle here. The angle here must be, again, 30 degrees. Was that too fast? You got it? OK. All right, so now I've found my normal. That's what I needed to, to draw this diagram for. And I need the electric field projected onto the normal because I need to solve the problem. I need to take e dot n. That's, that's step one. 
what's E dotted into n hat, I needed to find the n hat and know what the, normal, the angle was between them. So this diagram shows me that the angle between the electric field and that normal to the area is theta, the same, the same theta equals 30 degrees. So then I'm going to get magnitude of electric field times magnitude of n, sorry, times cosine of, in this case, it's 30 degrees. What's the magnitude of n? Yeah, it's 1. It's just set up that way. So the magnitude of E and then times this guy is going to be 1, and so I need a cosine of 30. Now, we'll finish that in just a second, but I want to show you that this, this other way that was mentioned of I could go through this diagram and take the projection of E on N. That's what the math formally says. It's actually equivalent to, to your physical intuition. Your physical intuition was, well, what if I do this a different way? And I think of I've got this area and I've got an electric field coming in this way, I could, rather than taking the projection of the electric field onto the normal, okay, I could take the projection of this area onto something that's perpendicular to the field. And it's geometrically equivalent, so use whichever way you like. Okay? And what you'll see is that if I take the projection of the area back onto here, I'm going to get a cosine theta. Whereas if I take the projection of E dotted into N, I'm also going to get a cosine theta. Okay, so I get, the, I get the same cosine either way. Do you have any questions about that part, about the geometry? Okay. All right, so now that we see where the normal is, we see that we're going to get this guy. Let me show you a cool trick, by the way. If you haven't seen this trick before, maybe it'll help you remember cosines. I'm going to set this aside for a second because I need cosine of 30. I know you just look it up on Wolfram Alpha, but there's a cool trick so that you won't have to look it up anymore just in case you know, you're stranded on a desert island and you have to calculate the cosine of 30 degrees and you don't have access to Wolfram Alpha until the satellite passes by. All right, so here's the unit circle. There's only a few angles that, that um, are worth memorizing on here, okay? So here I have this guy's pi over 2 up there, right? And then this guy's what? Uh, pi, well, pi over 4, pi over 6. This guy's pi over 3. The pi over 6 corresponds to our 30 degrees. And I can think about the cosines as the projections along the x-axis, right? That's why we draw the unit circle. So cosine of theta equals um, x component. All right. Now, I want to remember what these values are for the x components. And it's all over 2, yes? OK, so you start off with um, square root of 0 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. You see the pattern? Square root of something over 2, square root of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it actually, once you kind of get that trick in your head, you don't have to look it up, right? So now I can kind of read off my diagram and say, well, I needed this guy. Our theta was 30 degrees. So my cosine of 30 is going to be square root of 3 over 2, which I know you either already had memorized or look up in Wolfram Alpha, but that's kind of a fun trick in case you forget what it is. So we're back to here. Cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2. So I'm ready to finish the problem. I need the sum of e dot nda, so flux equals the sum over these e dot n hat delta a, the, the area, okay? And so we've already got the e dot n, okay? So that's magnitude of e um, cosine of 30 and times the area. And so our electric field was 5 newtons per coulomb. Cosine, we said, was square root of 3 over 2. In this case, the area is 1 meter times 0.2 meters is 1 fifth. So one fifth meter, and then I get that the fives cancel, and I get all together square root of three over two newtons meter squared per coulomb. That's the flux in that case. Okay. Do you have any questions about how that went? All right. And you see the way this cosine comes in. You can either directly take e dotted into n. Or if you prefer, you can think of projecting that area back onto something that's perpendicular to the electric field. Okay? And different cases will make sense in different physical situations. Any questions? All right. So now that we've calculated a flux and have thought about what a, what a flux means, Gauss's law is about a flux through a closed surface. Okay? So Gauss's law says, all right, let me take that, that flux. We had Define flux as the sum 
of e dot n over delta a's. And what we're going to think about then is taking whatever area you like and dividing it up into little boxes. Okay, those are the delta a's. And we're going to sum over all the boxes. And in the limit that all the boxes get teeny tiny, this becomes an integral. And we simply use a new symbol for it, integral e dot n dA. Okay? Now the circle on the integral, if you haven't seen that before, that just denotes a closed surface. When I'm thinking about fishing nets, I'm usually thinking about something that's open. Okay? But in the case of Gauss's law, when I think about a surface that's closed, and you can calculate flux through an open surface, and you can calculate flux through a closed surface. So in this case, Gauss's law, we're thinking of closed surfaces. And all that means is that the surface comes back on itself. Okay? It has no boundary. So this will be the electric flux through some closed surface. Think of like a bag encapsulating something, or a sphere, something like that, or a box, something that's closed. And we find that the total electric flux poking through that closed surface tells you the charge inside. So I get the sum over the charges inside over epsilon naught. So this is the statement of Gauss's law. Let's go through a little bit of the physical intuition of what that means. And I hope you'll see that the statement of the law is actually very reasonable according to what you already know. So let's say, for example, we take the, the first situation where let me have a point charge. Okay, What does a point charge do? Well, a point charge puts out an electric field all throughout space. It's kind of a starburst kind of shape goes like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared, pointing away from the charge if it's a positive point charge. Now let me enclose this thing in a box. Okay? Or maybe you want to enclose it in a sphere. Either way, put some closed surface around it. So what Gauss's law would tell you is that, all right, if I take uh, the integral of the electric field, the flux, the electric flux through that closed surface and add it up all over the entire box, it'll end up equaling q over epsilon naught, where q is the total charge inside. So I hope that's, um, I, I hope that's not too far-fetched of an idea, because for example, in this case, let's, let's put a positive charge inside that box. If all you had to measure was outside the box, okay, let's say you can't see in the box, but the box is like some cardboard box, so the electric field just uh, pokes right through it. And if you measured the electric field outside and you found it was a starburst shape that looked very like a, much like a point charge, you'd say, look, there's a point charge in the box. Or if you had it to do by Gauss's law, Gauss's law would say, well, don't walk around and measure the electric field directly. What you're going to do is go sit on the, you want to take this integral all over. So what you're going to do is go sit on the top of the box and walk along the surface of the top of the box. And you're going to take the box and divide it into squares. So on any given square, you're going to measure electric field dotted under the normal of the square times the area of the square. And set that aside and walk to the next square. Electric field dotted into the normal of that square times the area of that square. You're just going to sum it up all over the whole top of the box. And you'll get a positive contribution poking out of the top. You'll do that for all the surfaces of the box. And what you'll find is that the entire flux coming out of the box equals 1 over epsilon naught q inside. I'm not proving this to you, by the way. I'm just stating it for you. And we're going to show that it actually um, makes sense in the case of a point charge. And then we'll generalize that point charge case to other cases. So this is very much like the case of that faucet or the source of, uh, of the fountain. Right? In the case of the fountain, we saw that water was spilling over the edge of the bowl. And so if we think of a net being along the edge of the bowl, catching that water spilling out, we'd have to conclude there's a source somewhere inside. So we'd, we'd have a net flux out of the bowl, and we conclude there's a source inside here. In the same way that if I have a net electric field flux poking out of a closed container, I must conclude that there's a charge inside of that container. Does that make sense, given what you know about the shapes of electric fields coming off of point particles? Okay. Do you have any questions so far? All right. OK, so I can think of a negatively charged particle. So let's say that I had a negatively charged particle inside the box. Then you know that the electric field lines would point towards the negatively charged particle. And I could do the same calculation, walk along the surface of the box. On any given tiny square on the surface of the box, I'll calculate e dot n. In this case, uh, e dot n is going to be negative. Okay? How do I know that? When I have a closed surface, then everywhere on that surface, n is a normal that points away from the inside. Okay, so, so n points outside. So when I take the electric field here dotted into n, if n is pointing towards the outside and E is pointing towards the inside, E dot n is a negative number. So all along this box here, I'll get negative contributions summed up, and I'll find that there's a negative charge inside the box. Okay? This is, in, in the water analogy, this would be very much like 
like observing uh, a sink where you can see that the water is draining out of it. Okay? So if the water is draining out, then I would have net, uh, net water flux going into, um, into that sink there, going into the drain. So this tells you, you know, it's this analogy that is the origin of the source and drain or source and sink language that you often see in electricity and magnetism. In this case here, let's think of, of having no charge in the box. So now I've got this cardboard box with no charge in it, but let's say there's an electric field around to measure anyway, and the electric field just goes straight through the box. So let's say I have a constant electric field all pointing along the x-axis, and I just put the box somewhere in space where there's no charge inside. What I would measure then is, OK, in this case of a constant electric field going to the right, any of those areas that are parallel to the field will give me no contribution. All right? But this side to the right and this side to the left, those will give me contributions. And on this side here, I'd have that the electric field is poking out of the box. Where the electric field's poking out, I get a positive contribution. On the other side, where the electric field's pointing in, I get a negative contribution. The reason I get a negative contribution when the electric field's poking into a box is, remember, all along a closed surface, n points out. So n points out of the box over here. It's in the opposite direction to the e, so e dot n is a negative number. And so the contribution here is positive. The contribution there is negative. They cancel. So what I'd find, if I take Gauss's law, the sum of the flux over this cardboard box, in this case, I'd get 0. And that would tell me that there's no um, charge inside, which is the same situation as watching this fountain here, where I can see the water flow in, I see the water flow out. So if I measure the flow rate through um, you know, an imaginary bag inside here, I'd see that it flows in, it flows out, and there must not be any source or sink inside that spot. Do you have any questions about that or the analogy? OK. All right, does no questions mean it's clear? Or does no questions mean it's clear as mud and we should spend more time on it? OK, if you're good, go like this. If you want me to slow down, go like that. OK, all right, getting a lot of thumbs up. All right, so let's apply Gauss's law. Notice I did not prove Gauss's law to you. Okay, I'm just telling you what it is, giving you some physical intuition about it, and I'll show you how to use it. So Gauss's law, we already stated Gauss's law, but we want to look at how it works for a point charge. Okay? So in the point charge case, what I would think about is, well, I know what the electric field is for a point charge. It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, q over r squared times r hat. Okay, if Q is positive, the electric field points outward. If Q is negative, the electric field points inward. And Gauss's law would say, I need to now measure the flux. I need electric flux um, integrated over a surface. So I need the electric flux dotted into the normal of a surface and then integrate that all over the surface. So let me think of a point charge, and let me think of drawing a sphere around it. I've drawn several spheres here, but let's think of the outer sphere. Okay, so think of an outer sphere of radius r centered on that positively charged particle. In that case, if I think of taking this integral, surface integral of e dot n dA all over that sphere, well, what do I know? If I've got a sphere that's centered on the charge, okay, so let the sphere be a radius a, then anywhere I look along the sphere, the magnitude of the electric field is going to be the same, because I'm, I'm, I'm all at the same distance r away from the, from the point charge. Okay? So the magnitude anywhere I look is going to be according to this equation. It'll be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. That's just the magnitude. And you see that's here, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. That's the magnitude. I need to think now about dotting that into the normal. So think of this sphere, right? And when I'm standing at the top of the sphere, which direction does the normal point? If I'm right here at the North Pole, which direction does the normal point? Yeah, OK. And when I'm over here, the normal point's out. And when I'm down here at the south pole, the normal point's down. And it turns out that that's the exact same direction as the electric field, right? So I've set up, the, the, what's, what's nice about the mathematics here is that I've set up the, um, the net of Gauss's law to match the physical situation. Okay, I've put a sphere on it. And everywhere on this sphere, the electric field is poking straight out, and the electric field is normal to the sphere anywhere I look. Okay? So that means that anywhere I look, the magnitude of the electric field is the same. And anywhere I look on that sphere, e dot n is the same number. Does that make sense? This is actually the crux of how to do Gauss's law, how to apply <coughs> Gauss's law to a real problem. The, the, the entire, um, well, kind of the fun physics problem there is trying to find a shape where that's the case, trying to find a shape over which you can calculate Gauss's law in, in, a, in a pretty um, 
simple manner. So I have then that e dot n is the same everywhere on the sphere. And in fact, that it's a constant, OK? When I'm thinking of, well, what does this integral mean, the integral over the area? The integral over the surface area literally means take your area, divide it up into little boxes, so tile it with boxes, and add up the contribution in one box, go to the next box and add up the contribution, and so forth. So I'm going to move along the, along the area that way. And all along that surface, again, we already said that e dot n is a constant number, all right? and that this is its magnitude, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, q over r squared. And now, as I walk around the entire surface area of the sphere, the only thing left to add up is the areas in all the boxes. And if I add up the areas on all the boxes and sum up the entire area, what's the surface area of a sphere? It's not pi r squared, and it's not 4 thirds pi r squared. All right. It's pi, OK. It's four, 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. Thank you, front row. OK, so 4 pi r squared. That's the total area that I'm going to need. And you see what happened in this case. We were thinking about this largest sphere here. Notice that the r squared here, that's the same as the r squared there, right? I was sitting on a particular sphere. The magnitude of the electric field at that sphere is down by 1 over r squared. But then the area itself puts back in a contribution of r squared. So r squared cancels r squared. And the 4 pi's cancel, and I get all together q over epsilon naught. So this shows you what Gauss's law means for the point charge. And when I take an area that's spherical, OK, and notice that because the r squareds cancel, it didn't matter which sphere I was pointing to. I was thinking of the largest sphere. But the math applies equally well to the next sphere. And it applies equally well to the next sphere, and so forth. So for any size sphere centered on this, this is all being very reasonable. Do you have any questions so far? OK? Yep. All right. Now, here's what's kind of fun to think about. This cancellation of the r squareds, that's kind of, I don't know. When you see something simple like that happen in physics, we always, always look for a deep reason. Like if you do a really long calculation and you find out that the answer is 1, you go asking, well, was there a way to do this without the long calculation? OK? So in this case, the r is canceled. And we think there's something very deep going on there. We think that. In fact, the fact that as I get away, if I think about the magnitude of the electric field as I get away from a point charge, that electric field falls off like 1 over r squared. Okay? We think that's very much related to the fact that those electric field lines get distributed over an entire sphere of surface area, 4 pi r squared. That those r squares, in fact, are related. Okay? And we think that this is probably why gravity itself follows a 1 over r squared law as well. So we think there's probably something very deep there associated with the geometry of this universe, OK, uh, as far as why the electric field falls off like 1 over r squared. And you can uh, define analogously gravitational fields and see that they also fall off like 1 over r squared. So that's just kind of a, a fun fact there. Any questions so far? All right, so on each sphere, the electric field went like 1 over r squared. And on each sphere, the surface area went like r squared. Those cancel out to give me q over epsilon naught. All right. So now, I'd like, though, to see if we can think about this in a shape that's not a sphere. Right? I showed you it works for the sphere. But at the same time, Gauss's law is much more general than just the, the easy case, the sphere that I gave you. Gauss's law says this will work for any surface area that encloses that charge. So we did the sphere. All the spheres were easy. But what if I had a box? Or what if I had some funny wiggly shape? OK? Gauss's law says it doesn't matter. Think of this as like your fishing net. Remember, we started the class by talking about a fishing net and how much water was flowing through it. And even if the net deformed one way or the other, the flow rate through the pipe was the same. So in the same way, the flux coming off of this charged particle is the same. And it doesn't matter if I take my Gauss's sphere, think of it like a net, and if I deform that net a little bit, I'm going to catch the same amount of electric flux no matter what the shape of the net. OK, so that's kind of weird. Let me show you mathematically how that's going to work out. This slide got a star, by the way, because it's really important. So the star means, you know, I post the lecture notes online. And so when you see the stars on one of the slides, that's a really, really important uh, slide to go back and, and study. So I'd like to build up to the case. Let me show you where I'm heading. I'd like to build up to the case where I'm going to be able to take any funny shape. OK, I want to surround this charge by any shape I like. And and see how Gauss's law is going to work. So here's how we're going to get there. We saw 
that we could take any size sphere, and that worked. But let me think about a segment, OK? So let me think about this angle right here. It's kind of like Pac-Man now, eating a ghost that's over here. And so I've got a ray coming out and a ray coming out. And I just want to think about these little segments of spherical shells, OK? As long as these are all in that same wedge, the flux through that wedge is the same no matter where I look. The flux through this wedge is the same if I measure it here, or here, or here, or here. Does that make sense? OK, because as the electric field lines going, as the electric field is decreasing in magnitude, the area I'm sweeping out is also increasing in such a way that they cancel. Um, oh, that was a weird delay. <laughs> OK. Um, so in any segment, the contribution from any shell is the same, kind of like a flashlight, right? So think of this as like shining a flashlight. And if I'm shining a flashlight, it doesn't matter whether I look up close or far away. If I think of how many photons hit a particular spot, OK, and I move the, that spot away and so forth, as long as I'm catching the same angle of the flashlight, I'll catch all the photons, right? The photons coming out of the flashlight are the photons coming out. And whether they hit a piece of paper that's close by or hit a piece of paper that's farther away, I'll still get the same number of photons catching it. Does that analogy make sense? OK, so same thing going on here. Now, so the flux through any of these segments of the shell is the same. What about the flux along this line? So I have this radial line coming out. Okay, What's the flux along that radial line? Yeah. Oh, you have a question? No, you're just stretching. That's OK. All right, so if I think of having an area that is, um, that's parallel to the electric field lines. That's like trying to take a net and catch fish, but I put the net the wrong direction. Okay? Everything just passes it by. So if I think of some area that's along here, I'm not going to catch anything. All right? So we can think now, OK, so in any segment, in any co segment, the contribution from any shell is the same, kind of like a flashlight. So I'm going to break this up into several segments. Okay? I have the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and so on, all those different segments around the sphere. And now, what if I do this? I'm going to surround the charge with any shape by breaking it up into these segments. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the spheres at different places. Okay? So you see I've drawn this complicated blue line, but there are places where the blue line follows one sphere and then comes back down and follows another sphere and then comes back down and follows another sphere. So as long as I set this up carefully, all of my areas will either be lying on a sphere or the next area will be something that's completely perpendicular to that and catches no flux and goes back to the next sphere. And now I'm on a sphere again. And then the next segment is perpendicular and catches no flux. So I've set everything up in this geometry such that all the flux contributions are lying on the surface of the spheres. All the other ones have zero contribution. And now just think about making everything very finely grained, right? So in the same way that I can. Um, take any surface area I want and tile it with squares, as long as I make the squares small enough, or maybe you're used to tiling things with triangles instead. I can make any shape I like by making these spheres close together and just going to very small bits. Okay? This is just the idea of calculus, that I'm going to make any shape I like by adding up all these small contributions. So really, I could make any shape I like. Right? And I would just have to take the limit then that I have spherical shells that are very close to each other, and I'm going to hop on and off each shell um, in a very fine-grained manner. I don't know why that advanced again. <laughs> All right. So in, uh, the, the limit then gives me the case where I can consider any geometry I want. The limit of small segments works for any smooth shape. And then the flux through the outer surface, the flux, flux through the surface is the same, so it works for any shape I like. All right? So Gauss's law then says, take that flux over any enclosed surface and count up the flux, and you'll always get the sum of the charges inside over epsilon naught. Any, any questions about that? OK. All right. That's actually as far as I wanted to get today. So we're done for today, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.